1856, some miners had the unenviable task of clearing out a small cave in the quarry where they were working. As they did so, they came across some bones, arm bones, leg bones and ribs, and the top of a skull. As far as the miners were concerned, these remains were not human, but bare. And that assumption was not unreasonable, but bare they were not. Within a year they had been identified as something more human than bear, but not quite the same as us. That was the view of a local school teacher, who, with the support of a university anthropologist, identified the remains as belonging to an archaic human species. It was certainly closer to us than any ape, and like us, walked on two legs. But its shape and frame were outside the range of any known Homo sapiens, outside the range of us. A different view was again put forward in the 1870s by a pathologist who thought that the bones did belong to one of us, but to an unfortunate individual who suffered deformity. By the early 20th century, it was the schoolteacher's view that had prevailed. The species itself was named from the Neander Valley in Germany, where the discovery had been made, giving us Homo neanderthalis, Neanderthal man. Once the initial discovery was made, older discoveries were identified as belonging to the same species, and further remains were found. In comparison to Homo sapiens, the Neanderthals had heavy-set projecting brows, swept-back cheekbones, smaller chins, bigger chests, and flaring pelvises. On present evidence, the Neanderthals were largely confined to Europe, but also present in the Middle East and into Western Asia. The earliest possible remains have been dated to around 430,000 years or so ago, and the latest to around 40,000 years ago. After that, they disappear. In contrast, the oldest sapiens remains are found not in Europe, but in Africa. And they date back some 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. Later sapiens remains are found also in Asia and Europe, making it certain that for thousands of years, Neanderthals and sapiens lived in proximity to one another. This raises the question of what the relationship was exactly between these two populations. This question has been the study of archaeologists, paleontologists, anthropologists and geneticists, as a range of scientific disciplines have addressed the evidence, giving rise to a range of opinions about the lives of Neanderthals, even within one discipline. I have absolutely no expertise in any of these sciences, but have tried as best I can to understand what they have to say, in order to take account of what they have to say within a theological framework. Today I'm going to look at the Neanderthals and their relationship to us from a theological perspective, in the Catholic tradition. 
asking what a disciple of St Thomas Aquinas should make of them. Are they to be counted among the humanity God created in his image and likeness, and which fell into sin? Or are they to be counted instead among the other animal species of our world, represented in the first chapters of Genesis? Or are they something else? While creation itself is to be renewed through Christ at the last, according to Christian faith, Christ is said to die for our trespasses, for our sins. So did Christ die for Neanderthals. We should be clear from the outset what kind of answer we cannot give. If Christ did not die for Neanderthals, that cannot be because his sacrifice on the cross was not powerful enough to take them into account. Aquinas took the view that Christ's human death had an infinite, superabundant value. It was the death of a divine person. Christ's death must therefore be sufficient to deal with any and every human sin. If there is some sin for which Christ did not die, that cannot be because of any insufficiency in him or in his cross. But we would need to look for an explanation elsewhere. If we want to make theological sense of Neanderthals, we can start by asking if there are any models in the Thomist tradition which can throw light on them, apart from the species of our world already found in Genesis 1. One such model is the angels. Though angels do not explicitly appear in Genesis 1, their presence is found throughout scripture. Aquinas held that they too were created in God's image and were recipients of grace, although Christ did not die for them. But if Christ did not die for their sins, could this be a possible model for us to understand Neanderthals? I don't think we can, in fact, pursue this line, because Aquinas had a reason why Christ did not die for angels, and it had to do with their immaterial natures. Aquinas thought that angels had no matter, not even a spiritual matter. Aquinas associated immateriality with intellectual power, and he thought that the purely immaterial angels had very powerful intellects. But all this meant that, when they made their decision for or against God, that decision affected their whole being so thoroughly that their basic direction in regard to God was unchangeable. We humans, on the other hand, are bodily material beings, and our basic direction can be changed, albeit now only through divine grace. And so it makes sense for Christ to die for our sins, but not for those of angels. Neanderthals, however, were material like us, and so if they sinned, they should be able to repent by grace. So it seems that angels are not a good theological model for understanding Neanderthals, and we need to look elsewhere. Another possibility is that of alien life, unrelated to our own on other planets. Aquinas is clear that Christ's sacrifice is sufficient not only for this world, but for any worlds God might create. So, 
whether God has created other universes or there are other planets in this one populated by creatures made in God's image, Christ's sacrifice is enough for their sins too. Aquinas himself thought that God created only one order, in which we are the only rational animal. But theologians have since given thought to the status of possible life in God's image elsewhere. One issue is whether Christ, in becoming human, died for human beings only. Though his sacrifice may be sufficient for alien beings, it may not have been directed to them, but only to those of Christ's own species. Theologians have often thought of Christ making satisfaction on our behalf as a member of our human family, just as any of us might fittingly help out a family member who could not repay a debt. When discussing Christ's incarnation, Aquinas is clear that God could have become incarnate in a human nature created totally afresh. Such an incarnate person would be truly human by way of possessing a true human nature, but perhaps would not count as a member of our particular human family. But would that have been a fitting scenario for making satisfaction on behalf of us? Aquinas certainly thought it was fitting for Christ to be one of our human family, in that his humanity was not created totally afresh, but was provided by one of us, the Virgin Mary. But that would mean he could not be a member of other alien families, even alien families that were human. And Christ did not die for those families, but only for ours, the one of which he was a member. The question is whether, even if we regard Neanderthals as human in some sense, would they be members of our human family? the same human family as us? Are they like alien humans, or are they just us? It is here that genetics has made a decisive contribution by investigating the DNA, first of Homo sapiens, and more recently of Neanderthals. DNA is found in cells that make up the bodies of human beings and of all other life on Earth. Within this DNA lies a kind of code which provides what it's easy to think of as a kind of instruction manual, the genome, which contains information required for any organism's development. But, because every organism's DNA is inherited from a parent organism, DNA also encodes something about that organism's past its ancestry. Fine changes or mutations in an organism's DNA, which are then passed on to its descendants, but not to others, enables geneticists to build up a picture of how different living things, different species, are related to one another. We all know that DNA can be used to determine a paternity suit, And all of us can take a swab from the inside of our cheeks and submit our DNA for commercial analysis and learn something about our own ancestry. Such testing has shown, for example, that I am British. (laughs) But genetics has also told us more spectacular things about the more distant past because in decoding the DNA of all sorts of living things, geneticists can work out the relationship between them and determine which genetic events came before or after others. By estimating how often genetic mutations, which have then been passed down, occur, 
it's also possible to estimate dates for these events with some confidence, even if these dates are then open to revision as our knowledge grows. And so decoding DNA has uncovered something about the relationship between Neanderthals and us. How DNA came to be extracted from the bones of Neanderthals is a fascinating and exciting story in itself, and I recommend to you Neanderthal Man in Search of Lost Genomes by Svante Pabo, as well as Who We Are and How We Got Here, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past by David Reich. But the story begins with investigation of our own DNA. In 1987, a team of geneticists decoded a tiny fraction of the DNA of several individuals from around the world. Whereas most of our DNA is found in the nucleus of most of the cells that make up our body, this small fraction is found outside the cell's nucleus in what we might think of as the batteries or engines that power the cell, the mitochondria. <laughs> While our fathers, as well as our mothers, contribute to the DNA in the nucleus of our cells, only our mothers contribute this mitochondrial DNA. Each person receives it from their mother, and she from her mother, and she from her mother, back into history. This is what genealogists call the matrilineal line. Each of us has many, many lines of ancestry going back into the past. Each of us has two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, then 32 and 64 as we go back through the generations though eventually we will find the same people on different lines and the tree curves in on itself as the branches are entangled. But be that as it may, each of us has many, many lineages going back on a complex tree. Mitochondrial DNA passes down only one of these many lineages, from your mother back from her mother, her mother, and so on. If any two of us here could trace our matrilineal lines back, at some point we would meet a woman in common, an ancestor shared by us two on the matrilineal line, maybe thousands of years ago. The team of geneticists, making sense of the different genetic changes inherited in the DNA, by the different participants in their investigation, could construct a sort of family tree for the matrilineal lines of these different participants from around the world. The inheritance of different genetic mutations allowed the participants to be placed on different branches of the tree, each of which branched off at a different moment in time from the main trunk. Ultimately, following the matrilineal lines of everyone back, they met a single woman whom they dated to have lived 200,000 years ago. More recent estimates place mitochondrial Eve, as she became known, about 160,000 years ago. Now, although all of us here, and everyone outside this theatre, will be descended on their matrilineal lines from mitochondrial Eve. It is not being claimed that she was the first ever female human, or the only woman alive at the time, or anything like that. There is no reason to suppose that she was the Eve of the Bible. Other women were alive at the time, and while they may have had descendants they had no descendants on the matrilineal line that have survived down to the present day. Only mitochondrial Eve's matrilineal line has survived in all of us. 
genetics in fact suggests the Homo sapiens breeding population has always numbered some thousands. Mitochondrial Eve lived in such a population. The fact that those participants whose DNA branched off most deeply in time, most nearly to mitochondrial Eve, were from Africa, confirmed what the archaeological evidence had already suggested, that Sapiens was formed as a distinct population in Africa. This had immediate implications for the relationship of Sapiens to Neanderthals. Up to the 1980s, sapiens were widely thought to have evolved from archaic human species in different regions around the world, including the evolution of sapiens in Europe from Neanderthals. But now it was clear that all modern humans, no matter where in the world they live, had their origin in a single population, and that was in Africa. The Neanderthals, for whom there is no evidence of ever having lived in Africa, could not then be the parent species of European sapiens or any other sapiens. The tendency now was to think of the two as separate species, with a common descent from some earlier archaic population, but as essentially different from each other. The possibility of sapiens and Neanderthals interbreeding was mooted, but was widely thought to be rather unlikely. Either they couldn't, or they were just too different to try. At first it was only Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA that was tested, and these initial results in 1997 appeared to support a somewhat separate existence. If Neanderthal matrilineal lines had connected with Sapien matrilineal lines in the last few hundred thousand years, that would have been evidence that the two populations had interbred. But it appeared not to have been so. The most recent estimate for convergence on the matrilineal line is way back between 360,000 and 470,000 years ago, in some population ancestral to both Neanderthals and Sapiens. However, just as the investigation of the wider Sapiens genome, and not just mitochondrial DNA, had already filled out a more complex picture of human ancestry, so the investigation of wider Neanderthal DNA and comparison with Sapiens DNA revealed some procreation common to the two populations after all. More precisely, the result published in 2013 was that while people of only African descent showed no significant match between their DNA and that of Neanderthals, Neanderthals, after all, had never lived in Africa. Those of Asian and European descent did show such a match. In light of this fact, it makes best sense to think of this common procreation taking place within that segment of Homo sapiens that had crossed out of Africa around 50,000 years ago, of their meeting and having children with Neanderthals in the Middle East, before successfully spreading their own genes, now partly Neanderthal, through Asia and into Australia, Europe and eventually America. So how great is the contribution of Neanderthal DNA to people of European and Asian descent. We start from the fact that everyone receives 50% of their DNA from their father and 50% from their mother. My mother and I have both had our DNA tested by the same company and we were revealed to share 50% of our DNA. As a result of this, I was able to tell her that I now have a scientific basis for knowing she is my mother, rather than just taking her word for it. (laughs) 
And because everyone receives 50% of their DNA from their father and 50% from their mother, a child born of a single Neanderthal sapiens union would inherit 50% Neanderthal DNA and 50% sapiens. The proportion of Neanderthal DNA in descendants living in an entirely sapiens population would then have decreased with each generation after that union. One sapien skeleton from Romania, dated to about 40,000 years ago, had around 6 to 9% Neanderthal DNA. At some point, this figure levelled out across the Eurasian population at about 2%. Europeans and Asians today show a match of around 1.5 to 2.1%. According to the National Geographic's Genographic Project, I have 1.9% Neanderthal DNA. Our Lady, then, would certainly have had about 2% Neanderthal DNA, and our Lord would have inherited DNA from her. Jesus' virginal conception makes his own genetic makeup a bit of a mystery, of course, because he had no human father to provide a Y chromosome of DNA to make him male, or any other DNA. But however we make sense of this, we should conclude that when the word became flesh, the word became Neanderthal, or around 2%. But what is the significance of Christ's Neanderthal DNA? Perhaps not very much, if the Neanderthals were just as human as us. And we might have reason to think they were, given that we had children together. There are different views about how to define a biological species, but it is most commonly thought that compatibility for breeding is the key criterion. If they can breed, they're the same species. And although they may have been on separate evolutionary pathways and one day be no longer able to reproduce together successfully, when they met... Sapiens and Neanderthals could still manage to produce some fertile offspring. But is it possible that this might count as two distinct species being able to interbreed, rather than sapiens and Neanderthals counting as a single species? It seems to me that we have a specifically theological reason to consider that possibility. People sometimes wonder how a genetic account of human origins in a population of some thousands is compatible with traditional Christian teaching that we descend from a single couple. Aquinas thought we descended from a single couple, and this is very much bound up with his theology of original sin. Pope Pius XII taught that, since it is not evident how original sin can be reconciled with a larger original population, we must stick with an origin from a single couple. Some theologians think we must accept the picture presented by science and adjust our theology of original sin. However, the data of genetics and church teaching is not actually in conflict if we distinguish between the human species defined in biological terms and the human species viewed in theological terms, that is, defined by the image of God. The theological difference here would be the presence of an immortal soul, making us human without qualification. Aquinas held that what fundamentally differentiates the human being from all other animals, is the fact that the human soul is a subsistent immaterial soul, intellectual and immortal. It is by way of this soul which enables acts of higher knowledge and love, and potentially acts of knowing and loving God, 
that human beings are in the image of God. If we accept that only one original couple was theologically human, but had a wider population with which they could procreate, but where having only one parent with an immortal soul was sufficient to get an immortal soul yourself, then we can conclude that the image of God would have spread through the population within generations, and all biological humans would eventually be theological humans too. One consequence of this way of thinking is that early theological human beings interbred with non-theological human beings. But if that was the case then, why couldn't it be the case when sapiens and Neanderthals met? Given that sapiens were already in the image of God, perhaps they had children with Neanderthals who were not. Though the Neanderthals may have been biologically the same species, perhaps they were not the same species theologically. So were Neanderthals theologically human or not? I think the only way we can approach this question is to ask whether or not Neanderthals had immortal souls, as we do. But, apart from Christian teaching, how do we know that we even have such souls? We cannot just have a look at our immaterial, invisible souls. And Aquinas thought that we only know the character of our souls through what we do. Aquinas argues from the fact that we make intellectual acts of knowledge of things abstracted from their material conditions to the immateriality of the intellectual soul. Our knowledge is not just of particulars, but is universal, enabling pursuits like philosophy and science, and the potential to be elevated by God to supernatural knowledge and love of him. If human knowing were more limited to a material process, Aquinas does not think our souls would be such subsistent immaterial souls. Finding evidence of intellectual flights throughout the history of sapiens, though, is difficult enough, let alone in Neanderthals. The rise of Greek philosophy, or Western science, is explained through a multitude of factors. They may require a subsistent immaterial soul, but that soul's presence doesn't guarantee we will all be philosophers or scientists. So what other evidence can we look for in support of the presence of an immortal soul? Aquinas defines human beings as rational animals, not only immaterial, but also material. Human beings lead an animal life, but one that participates in intellectuality. We have emotions or passions, as many animals do on Aquinas' view, but our passions are not generic animal emotions, but participate in reason. We're often surprised at the wonderful capabilities of other animals, and it's sometimes difficult not to suppose that they think rationally as we do. Aquinas had a very high estimate of the lives and capabilities of non-rational animals. And he would not have been surprised at all by all we now know about the lives and capabilities of other species. This should put us on our guard against assuming that some sophisticated behaviour attributed to Neanderthals must automatically mean 
that they had immortal souls. Non-human animals have all sorts of levels of sophistication. They have a sense of danger, for example, imagination, the ability to solve problems. They can cooperate to achieve goals, communicate through gestures and sounds, have a sense of beauty and of another's perspective. On a Thomist view, much of animal capability is taken up into human intellectual life and participates in it, is shaped by it. People who reject the immortal soul have often looked for human distinctiveness in some particular behaviour, like organised hunting or tool use. But these searches normally fail when such things are found in some form among other species, whether living or in the archaeological record. What we need to look for in the case of Neanderthals is evidence of some behaviour that bears the mark of an intellectual soul such as we have. Popular candidates have included burial of the dead. The oldest burials found are in a cave in Spain, dated to some 430,000 years ago. But whether this burial was a ritual or religious act, as we practice burial, cannot be known without a wider context. Stone circles found in a cave in France, dated to around 180,000 years ago, suggest religion, perhaps, but certainly the formation of a place into some sort of space, perhaps the making of meaning. Another candidate is care for the sick and elderly. The discovery in a cave in Iraq of a skeleton of an older, half-blind Neanderthal man with a withered arm suggests evidence that he must have been cared for by his community during his lifetime. Are these finds evidence of the intellect a Thomist would associate with a subsistent immaterial soul? Or might the Neanderthals have been sophisticated, non-rational animals, giving shape to their domestic space, as many species carve out a niche for their home, caring for the disabled, for whom we might easily imagine valued roles in a non-rational group despite disability, and expressing feeling for their dead, as some animals do. Without further context, such evidence is difficult to interpret. Of course, most of the evidence of the lives that Neanderthals led does not survive. Wooden artefacts, for example, will only very rarely survive in the archaeological record. And the best evidence we can have for a subsistent immaterial soul is surely language. A Thomist might suppose that it is the immateriality of the human soul that elevates the capacity for communication we find in other animals to be able then to signify the most abstract of ideas, to form potentially an infinity of different sentences, to tell stories that narrate alternative worlds or envision the future. Though all sorts of animals communicate through signs, whether vocal or not, no other animal speaks with such language. But spoken language is, of its nature, lost to the limitations of the archaeological record, and writing appears only relatively late in our story, after about 8,000 years ago. Neanderthals certainly had much the same anatomy as sapiens for producing vocalised sounds, and genetics might suggest that Neanderthals had a capacity for language because they share with sapiens much the same form of a gene that we know to be important for linguistic communication. However, while that seems to suggest Neanderthals were somehow disposed for human language, without knowing that they had an immortal soul to elevate that communicative ability, a Thomist is thrown back on the archaeological record, searching for indirect evidence of language in human culture, say in technology or art, which might in themselves be evidence 
for an intellectual soul. We should note, though, that archaeology hardly gives us any certainty of when sapiens first spoke. Anthropologists seem to be certain language was there before 40,000 years ago, and this is based on such evidence as the cave paintings that appear around that time in Asia, together with other sophisticated graphic art, figurines, bone carvings and so on, which point to a human intellect that could think linguistically and symbolically, even religiously. Some speak of a cognitive revolution about this time, when so many different elements of human culture gradually came together en masse, on analogy, I suppose, with the later agricultural, scientific and industrial revolutions and the technological revolution we're experiencing today. Despite no direct evidence of language, anthropologists normally seem loath to suppose that sapiens hadn't been telling stories and gossiping for thousands of years before any such revolution. Artifacts that are considered possible indicators of language and intellect can be found in the sapiens archaeological record far earlier, if more sparsely. The fact that the whole sapiens population across the world eventually manifests this level of capability suggests to some that the beginning of human language lies back prior to the dispersal of the original sapiens population around and out of Africa. From a theological point of view, this would make sense, because the appearance of the immaterial soul before the dispersal of sapiens would fittingly guarantee the fundamental unity of all subsequent sapiens, a unity to be perfected in Christ. But this leads us back to why we should not count Neanderthals in this unity too. After all, when the archaeological record of Neanderthals and earlier sapiens is compared, it's not startlingly different. What has perhaps been most startling was the announcement in 2018 that cave paintings had been found in Spain dated to before 60,000 years ago. Large red and black squares were painted like frames, and in one frame there's an outline of an animal's hind legs, in another the head of an animal, as well as geometric shapes and what might be a human figure. But since sapiens were not yet found in Europe, the Neanderthals are currently the only candidates we have for the artists. If that identification is correct, it would surely suggest that Neanderthals had capacities not wildly different from those found among sapiens some 20,000 years later in their cognitive revolution. There are also other examples of art not dissimilar from what we find among sapiens. Paint from red iron oxide, presumably to paint themselves, each other or something else. A necklace of eagle talons in Croatia about 130,000 years ago, and beads of punctured shell and animal teeth found in France and Germany. The way that they treated the bones of some birds they caught indicates they were not butchering them for food, but for their feathers, presumably for self-adornment. Again, such clothing and jewellery suggest a certain symbolic value to what they were doing. And none of this suggests a significantly different material culture from sapiens of roughly the same periods. Another significant way in which Neanderthals and early sapiens were similar was in their stone technology. The first archaic human species in Africa, two million years ago or more, inherited from their hominid ancestors the making of tools by hammering stone to produce flakes, blades which could cut or chop. An expanded set of tools, including hand axes, produced by a more complex process, is found after 1.5 or so million years ago, 
with upgrades some 600,000 years ago and 300,000 years ago. Their makers surely worked according to a mental image of the blade that lay within the stone. At some point, though, stone technology must have been the eventual fruit of the elevation of the animal capacity for tools by the intellectual soul. Longer, more complex preparation of the stone material to produce a better blade, requiring more carefully directed blows, as well as the rotation and inspection of the stone, indicates a more complex advanced grasp by the toolmakers of the end product and of the stages involved. And the whole process is something any of us would find a massive challenge to accomplish. Complex tools were also made by fixing parts together, say a stone spearhead to a wooden shaft. Neanderthals, as well as sapiens, employed all this technology, and perhaps language helped in its successful transmission. But if we suppose the sapiens who used this technology were employing immaterial intellect, we have to wonder whether the Neanderthals were too. How, though, does any of this make a difference to theology in the tradition of Aquinas? If Neanderthals were created in God's image and saved by Christ, this must expand our understanding of Christ's Ark of Salvation and raise questions about how his saving grace was made available to them. Because the Church teaches that God offers salvation through Christ to every person in some way, theologians have often asked in recent times how this offer is made to those who have not heard the Gospel, members of other religions, and even atheists. It seems to me that, just as modern science has enlarged our sense of the physical universe, the inclusion of Neanderthals in theological humanity would somehow expand our sense of human salvation, given that that salvation through Christ was effected in the kind of life Neanderthals led. Moreover, in what we can find of Neanderthal life, if it's truly human, we should be able to see ourselves as in a partial mirror, suggesting the importance to our own salvation, say, of a spirituality of work and technology, and the importance of Christian art and of beauty in the liturgy. None of those things are discovered because of the discovery of Neanderthals. And yet the discovery that something is truly ancient to humanity must surely influence our theological focus today. But even if Neanderthal inclusion does not pay immediate theological dividends, at least for apologetic reasons, it seems necessary for theology to take account of their discovery. Unless theologians do, they risk the appearance of leaving faith and science in separately sealed worlds, as though our faith cannot cope with advancing human knowledge, leaving faith culturally marooned and seemingly irrelevant to many. That is exactly the opposite of the attitude of Aquinas, who, confident that all truth comes from God, in his own day confirmed Christian wisdom by integrating into it what he knew of human science. Thank you very much for listening.
Do we have any scientific knowledge about why Neanderthals went extinct? And would the fact that they did go extinct have any bearing on whether they had an immortal soul? I think that uh, the, uh, the present way of thinking is that Neanderthals may have gone extinct in different places for different reasons. But the way that the thinking seems generally to be going is because, well, say, the, the, it, there was a kind of, uh, things got very cold in northern Europe and uh, every few centuries or so and they were moving up and down. Perhaps they lost population. In the end, they had a smaller population say there was more inbreeding, and so ultimately they didn't have the kind of diversity to be able to continue their population. Also, there may have been uh, pressures then on them that they couldn't really um, deal with the pressures in their environment so well, perhaps, or maybe they uh, had some trouble with Homo sapiens. We don't really know what the reasons might have been. But I think if we see them as only going extinct as a distinct population, but as not going in, uh, extinct insofar as they live in many of us, then I think that there may not be any particular implications for their theological status. Thank you, Father Simon. Um, uh, the question I had was, given that there could be a, that... Christ had Neanderthal ancestors uh, based on the 1.5 to 2.5%, but the Neanderthals have exhibited um, behaviors that could be in concordance with having a soul before having encountered the, uh, the Homo sapiens from Africa. This would imply that, that there were Neanderthals with souls prior to the interaction with Homo sapiens, yeah. and therefore there would have been rational beings not descended from Adam uh, who are in the ancestry of Christ. Um, this seems to point to the fact that there would, if Neanderthals were, um, were redeemed by Christ, that they also would have had to have a common ancestor that had committed an original sin as well, and that it would have to have gone back to that original Neanderthal couple. Um, does this seem like uh, a reasonable assumption, then? I think it would be more likely to think of uh, there being only one human population that includes Neanderthals as well as sapiens, and that they are descended from a single Adam. So they wouldn't, as it were, have one Adam each, but there would be an Adam in a population that was ancestral to both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And I think only in that way can we make proper sense, maybe, of the doctrine of original sin, so that they're all, as it were, theologically human, both Neanderthals and sapiens, and other populations as well, like the Denisovans. So, but you're still thinking of one theological humanity uh, that comes from only one Adam. So, Regis, uh, thank you for your presentation. It thank was very, uh, very, uh, very interesting. My question is, would rationality and animality put together be enough to constitute any species, a theological species, as no matter what the body shape or environment? And if you can think you're a supernatural, you can be raised to the supernatural? Perhaps, Yes. So one might think in terms of, of rational animality as having different possible forms in different kind of animal species. That's not to say that any body is, is uh, suitable to be disposed for a rational soul, but it might be that God could create um, you know, rational dolphins or, or rational elephants that, well, that would be open to, to God to do. We found rational dolphin-like mm. creatures, yeah. and we decided they were theologically relevant, uh, they were theological beings. That would put an end to worries about whether they, you know, a biological species, right? I mean, that would make that ir uh, uh, not decisive. What would matter well, would be uh, that you would, yeah. you would think and that you would have a body. 
in, in a way, it wouldn't be that biological species would no longer be unimportant to whether you wanted to breed with a dolphin on another right. plate. You know, it would still be significant, but not in that respect. So you could think. And, but whether they would be the same theological species is another matter. But one might think that if Neanderthals and sapiens had continued to grow apart on, on separate evolutionary pathways, that each would have undergone a mutation such that they could no longer uh, breed with one another. But they might still be the same theological species even. So you are getting into all those kinds of possibilities, at least theoretically, yes. Could I ask two questions? Mm-hmm. One, um, were Neanderthals who had not yet intermarried with Homo sapiens participate in original sin? And thus would Jesus die for their sin? And second, more complicated, I know that in the early modern Protestant world, there was speculation about pre-Adamite human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, people who were human the word Adam, they were part of our race, mm-hmm. uh, such as who are the people that Cain goes out and intermarries with and founds a city for. Uh, was there speculation of pre-Adamites in early modern Catholic theology? The first question was uh, whether Neanderthals who hadn't yet met Homo sapiens would have had uh, been involved in original sin. I'm thinking that way, yes. I'm not thinking that maybe Neanderthals who met uh, Homo sapiens got turned into theological human beings through meeting them. I was thinking more of the possibility that they would all be involved in some single original sin event. And uh, I was thinking of the... um, as it were, someone inheriting a soul from only one parent, although they don't actually inherit it technically. I was thinking of that happening merely in the original population. I wasn't necessarily thinking myself that that would have happened when Neanderthals and Sapiens met. And the second question, I've deliberately tried not to bring any pre-Adamites into this, although there might be pre-Adamites in a biological sense, I would count only those to be truly human as those who are human in a theological sense. So um, the once original sin takes place, the only true human beings would be those descended from Adam. I've tried to do it in that kind of way because I understand that that's what the magisterium of the Catholic Church teaches. So that's really what... Uh, being a Catholic theologian involves taking account of as part of the data. Um, Father Simon, this is incredibly interesting. But would you say, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely happy with the line, the question that Father Corbett raises about other... I mean, there's, there are reasons, and, and, and you laid them out magnificently, why we would be thinking in this conversation about sapiens and Neanderthals, and that, that mm-hmm. evidence, that's evidence in the DNA. But we, there's no evidence of it. I mean, I don't... When it becomes too hypothetical about the, the possibility of dolphins and yeah. that, that I think is not okay. helpful. I wasn't However, making any claims I, I about... Yeah, yeah. yeah. That I, I, would, I would want to caution, because, I, you know, I, we've always said that... Um, <clears throat> that Thomas, Thomas have uh, a kind of allergic reaction to hypothetical, but this is see what you're doing is not hypothetical in the strict sense because you are using evidence that connects Neanderthal and yeah. Sapiens. However, the more there is the incredibly interesting question about extraterrestrials, <clears throat> which that I think uh, there I think the the path that you laid out. It's hugely important because, although I don't think there are any, frankly, I'm a kind of rare earth guy. But um, I'm sorry, I missed that. You're a what guy? <laughs> rare earth. I mean, oh right, okay. The likelihood yeah, that sure. there's other, there are other yeah. planets uh, of sufficient complexity to support mm-hmm. intelligent life as we know it. Uh, anyway, that's that's all I. Uh, yeah. I would I would be ca- I would be cautious about these more I, I speculative was... questions about various different kinds of biological species that show no significant connection apart from the 
connections. Yeah. The connections and everything. Uh, every, every form of life on Earth shows connections in their DNA. I was being purely hypothetical when I was speaking about other possible theological species simply because I don't think it's impossible for God to create those things. I wouldn't make any claim that he has. As for hypothetical questions, I, despite being a Thomist, I do think hypothetical questions are great, largely because it helps us focus on the wisdom of what God has actually done. Thank you so much for your presentation, Father. Okay. Very interesting. Um, I have a question about uh, the that kind of connects to the larger concern that's gone around in recent decades about the possibility of we human beings inventing uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that might be able to uh, rationally process things and might even hypothetically become self-aware. That's a concept that's bantied about a lot. Um, my, my question is, uh, what, what what might be the theological uh, classification or status of a being or of some some something, I guess, for lack of a better term that I can think of, uh, that was created by humans and not necessarily uh, by God through natural processes. Mm -hmm. I think that anything that was made like that, uh, manufactured like that, would would essentially be a kind of a machine of parts. It wouldn't have that kind of u single unity that an organism would have. So I think its status would be entirely different. And of course, if you, if you begin from the presupposition that immateriality and intellectuality are connected, I mean, from the very beginning, you're going to be very suspicious that we could create something that would have the equivalent of an immaterial soul. So it depends on your starting points on this, but those are mine. And I'd be very suspicious of anything that said that we could create intellectuality in the true sense. Um, so, you're saying that, or you're insinuating that, both Neanderthals <coughs> and Sapiens came from Adam and Eve, but mm -hmm. are different species, and we can hold this is true, but we just don't have the science to prove it yet? Is that mm -hmm. what you're saying? Uh, most, I suppose, where I was going to say it, most are different subspecies, but they'd actually be the same species. I suppose that we might, in the future, be able to, to come to more certainty about where these two populations came from. And normally, people think they come from some version of Homo heidelbergensis, and you know that, that could well be true. But I don't know that we can ever prove things that are, are matters of our faith, like you know where what is symbolised by the Garden of Eden was. I'm not expecting that science will be able to prove anything about that or you know, about the quality of life led by our first ancestors. I'm not supposing we'll be able to do that. It might be that science is able to tell us more uh, through archaeology about the material culture of some of these beings, and perhaps we'll be able to have more of a sense of the cognitive abilities that uh, would enable certain kinds of technology. And it may be that philosophically we'll be able to connect levels of cognitive ability with a kind of Thomist understanding of the immaterial soul. So I think that advances might be made in some things, but I'm not expecting science to prove all, all of these kinds of questions, and certainly not matters that are strictly of revealed, uh, revealed to faith. Well, again, I'm wondering, there was a bunch of hands popping up, but I'm, I'm hoping I can, can uh, take the moderator's prerogative to ask a question of my own. Uh, to focus a little more on the soteriological uh, mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. you mentioned the importance in the tradition of thinking of Christ as being part of our family, mm -hmm. as having a kind of, um, well, in a certain sense, a genetic, although not thought of in the DNA sense, uh, origin with us, that he, he assumes mm -hmm. uh, what has fallen and uh, elevates it, redeems it, and elevates it. Could you say a little more about uh, how that idea, how important you think that is uh, for Aquinas saying that, say, Christ's, uh, the salvation he wins is sufficient for this world and any other world that could exist, something like that? Or uh, perhaps how we would think then about the metaphor of the body, Christ as the head of the body, mm -hmm. uh, and us belonging to the body of Christ, if 
uh, somehow there were rational creatures that were not mm -hmm. of the same genetic origin, something like that. Do you have any comments about the, the importance of that principle on the theological side? Okay. I'm not really sure how to answer that, but I, I will make the observation that Aquinas thinks that Christ is the head of angels as well as of human beings. And angels are, of course, a, a multitude of different species. And yet, he thinks that, that Christ can be the head of them too. And certainly, they can receive grace from him as well as us. So I think there might be a sense in what, which one could see something larger. But in terms of redemption itself, I do think it's important that Christ become one of us in order to redeem us, because he doesn't redeem angels, um, that, that's, that's uh, as I understand it. So, it, but, you know, if, if we discovered other species that I don't know, you know, how I would have to revise that, but I'm not thinking in, in, in terms of, of other species like that. I just have intend to to think of our own. And I um, and I might have to revise things how I thought if it turned out that there were a, a other species who requested baptism. But, you know, I haven't really thought that far. But Christ's headship need not only be over our species, but we already know he's the head of angels too. Thank you, uh, Father. It was very interesting. My question is, so, sorry. So, as you mentioned, we kind of, I guess, in your the way you've been theorizing this evening, we've pushed the uh, original theological Adam and Eve back to, for example, the current thinking if to be compatible with your idea to be Homo heidelbergensis. Yeah. Okay. So, in this original group of Homo heidelbergensis, is it even possible to theorize about? Why these two individuals, what allowed them to become separate and become both biologically and theologically human among the rest of this primordial group? I mean, I think I'd see them first as distinguished by having subsistent immaterial souls, which the wider group wouldn't have. But also I think it's revealed to us in the scriptures that God offered friendship or established the first human beings in an intimacy with him and from from which was then lost and I think that it's important to think about that supernatural life for the first human beings as well as having a, a different kind of soul from the wider breeding population that's the kind of thing I would think of so you would say that they it would be it wouldn't they would the two of them would be well aware that something had happened. I think so, because they would have a kind of intimacy with God, and therefore with each other, that was different from what they would experience with any other creatures, including the people that they, that they were biologically the same species as. And I think somehow I'm reading this from Genesis chapter 2. Thank you. Uh, well, hopefully this will count only as one. I've got a question about the scientific evidence, almost a pure scientific uh, question, and then the impact on uh, our theological approach to it. Uh, so the first, is there any uh, scientific limit on the kind of evidence that we could, uh, we could find sort of uh, back into history? So I think we're, we've tapped at, it's particularly about the uh, the evidence of art and uh, abstract tools for uh, homo neanderthalensis. Uh, and see, can we get back to, uh, conceivably, could we discover something at the origin of homo neanderthalensis or back to a common ancestor that could indicate um, intelligence? Uh, so that's the first set of questions. Maybe. <laughs> that's all I want to say, maybe. Um, so if if we uh, if that is not possible, how does uh, a Catholic uh, theologian sort of grapple with the the polygenism monogenism question? Uh, if uh, perhaps there is um, some some break where there is no evidence uh, whatsoever, even though we can find it uh, back to a common ancestor, no evidence of intelligence after uh, Homo sapiens Homo neanderthalensis split 
uh, how does a faithful Catholic theologian deal with um, sort of if, if we're going to hypothesize some definitive split uh, evidence? On, on the question of monogenism and polygenism, which you raise, it seems to me that that might be settled on purely theological grounds because there, there really isn't scientific evidence of a kind that's going to determine that question for us. I think it can be, if you make the kind of distinction that I've made between theological and biological humanity, and there might be other ways to do this, then I think it's really a theological question rather than the one that's just going to be settled for us by scientific evidence. So I think that a Catholic theologian can proceed in that kind of way. Uh, and just, just to make an observation, the more and more, it, it, in terms of evidence for intellectuality in the past, it seems to keep going further and further back into the past. It's not as though anything's being definitively disproved from the more distant past and it's being pushed forward. It seems more to be being pushed back in terms of the history of science. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, it's, it's, I think, rather strange terrain uh, for theologians to be embarking on, and it's, I, I respect that. Um, my, my question, sometimes we hear about sort of the Jesus of uh, history and the Christ of faith, and I kind of want to, I think that could be illuminating for thinking about sort of the Adam of faith, which you mm -hmm. kind of alluded to with Thomas Aquinas' mm -hmm. view, what we might take as a naive reading of the Bible, um, maybe the Catholic dogmatic tradition in general, and kind of the atom of paleontology. Um, and a lot of questions have, have, have centered on this, but I, I guess, I mean, is there not a bit more tension between the atom of faith and the atom of paleontology than maybe, you know, was, was referenced tonight? I mean, is it really just as simple as sort of extending back the timeline a bit, you know, 60, 70,000 years, uh, to, to kind of fit those together? Or, you know, is the tension acute enough that, that people would say these things really can't be reconciled. Mm -hmm. The atom that's presented to us in the kind of Christian dogmatic tradition doesn't really fit with the atom of paleontology, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I wanted to hear you reflect a bit more on the tensions okay. uh, that exist that seem pretty evident between the atom of faith and, and the atom of, of paleontology. I had myself found the tension so great once you make a distinction between theological and biological humanity, it seems to me that that does resolve a lot of the apparent tensions in the whole thing. Now, I might be, I might, my view might be quite limited in various ways on this, but my thinking is that it's not so, so much in tension as it might first appear. I'd hope to say the same of the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history. <laughs> Let's give our thanks to Father King. Thank you very much.